privilege of introducing Dr. Matthew Mion, who currently serves as the Director of Functional Neurosurgery at Swedish Medical Center. After completing his residency at Mass General and his function of fellowship at Emory, he moved here to Denver, where he has built one of the busiest private practice functional neurosurgery programs in the country. He has gained great respect from his peers for many reasons, which all include doing what is best for his patients. Uh, recently, he welcomed his first son. Uh, he's seven months old now. Um, so maybe if you head on to his social media, you'll be able to see a few pictures. <laughs> but thank you so much for joining us today. And uh, thank you, Dr. Mion, for speaking to us. Uh, well, thank you very much, Kelly. And thank you to the Parkinson's Association for giving me the opportunity to speak today. Um, I've given different versions of this talk um, in the last few years, and I was excited when I went through the slides last night to see that actually there's some new stuff on the horizon that I was able to add, and, and so I, I'm really excited. I think this is um, a really dynamic uh, time in our uh, approach and thinking about Parkinson's disease, and I hope to share a little bit about um, what is kind of new uh, in the realm of surgery for Parkinson's disease, which I'm sure many of you uh, have heard about, maybe many of you have maybe even had. So um, I think Kelly uh, introduced me, but um, just a little bit of my background, we don't, we don't have to dwell on that, but um, I really wanted to focus on three things today. Um, so the first is just a general background on Parkinson's disease. This may be familiar to many of you, but I think a refresher is always helpful. Um, and then we're going to talk about surgery. So uh, who, what, when, where, uh, why, how, all the kind of nuts and bolts, the nitty gritty. And um, I'll go through um, kind of what I talk about with patients in the clinic when I meet them and we're thinking about surgery for Parkinson's. And then we're going to spend the last part of the talk talking about what's new in uh, this space and what's the latest and greatest in terms of technology and advances we have in our field. So just by way of background, Parkinson's disease is uh, very common. It affects about 1% of people over the age of 65. So we think that in the United States, there's about a million uh, patients who are affected. Um, of course, it can also affect patients under the age of 65, but the incidence grows with age. Um, we think that Parkinson's is related to a gradual loss of cells in the brain that produce a chemical called dopamine. Um, we don't know why these cells die off or disappear. There's different theories, and there's probably more than one reason that, that affects different patients. But nonetheless, dopamine loss affects a variety of things in the body and in the brain. Um, and in particular in the brain, it affects uh, a circuit or a set of structures called the basal ganglia. And it's this impact on the basal ganglia that we think is related to many of the movement symptoms or motion or motor symptoms of Parkinson's that often lead to the diagnosis. Um, so one of the principal places that these cells are lost is in a little strip of tissue, just a, fill, a few millimeters wide called the substantia nigra. It's down here. I think you guys can see my mouse, but um, it's down here at the base of the brain. And if you were to uh, uh, section the brain of someone with Parkinson's disease versus a patient who did not have Parkinson's, you'd see that this stripe is very thinned or uh, faded. Um, this is what that looks like uh, on a pathology slide. Um, and we don't have ways to, to test for this directly in live patients. Those are from autopsy studies that I just showed you, but um, we have other studies that help us kind of get at the same question or investigate uh, a loss of dopamine. The main one is something called the DAT scan, which you might've heard of. Uh, this is not a perfect diagnostic tool, but it's something that's often used to support or refute a diagnosis of Parkinson's disease. And uh, we can see that there is a disorganization of dopamine uptake in the brain as Parkinson's disease progresses. And so this is something that your neurologist may think about ordering uh, to help with your diagnosis. But again, this is not a perfect uh, study. Um, so what is dopamine? Uh, what does it do? It turns out it's a neurotransmitter. It's a chemical that's used to signal between different nerve cells. <clears throat> so it's released from one neuron to activate a nearby neuron. And as you lose it, um, and, and particularly as you lose it in the basal ganglia, uh, patients can develop some of these motor symptoms or movement symptoms that uh, are familiar to many of you. So 
uh, bradykinesia or slowness of movement, uh, rigidity or stiffness, uh, of course, the tremor of Parkinson's disease that we'll talk more about, um, and then later in the disease, problems with posture or balance um, that can make gait or walking difficult. It turns out that these movement or motor symptoms are actually relatively late uh, manifestations of Parkinson's disease. Um, they're often the ones that are outwardly visible and lead to the diagnosis. But uh, for many patients, if you ask them, in retrospect, they've had other symptoms for five, even 10 years before. Um, these symptoms are kind of nonspecific, and so they generally don't raise concern for something like Parkinson's disease, but they can include things like constipation, daytime sleepiness, depression, loss of sense of smell, uh, and we think that the movement or motor symptoms develop a little bit later. Uh, so because dopamine is the chemical that's lost in Parkinson's disease, most of the initial therapies for Parkinson's, i.e. medicines, uh, target the loss of that chemical and really just try to replace dopamine. And they specifically try to replace it in that cleft that exists between nerve cells uh, to allow the cells to signal between one another. And so the common one that you guys have, I'm, I'm sure, heard of is levodopa uh, or carbidopa levodopa or Cinemet. But there's all sorts of other drugs that act through different mechanisms just to try to increase the amount of dopamine between uh, nerve cells. Um, and then we know um, from, from various studies that the level of dopamine in the brain correlates with movement symptoms. And that's true in general, and it's true kind of on a minute-to-minute -minute basis during the day. Uh, and so we'll refer to two states in Parkinson's, and these may be very familiar to you, but um, we call an on state when dopamine levels are relatively high and patients have movements that are very fluid or feel natural. There may not be much rigidity. There may not be much tremor. And we contrast this with an off state where dopamine levels are uh, lower in the brain. Movements can be slow. There may be rigidity and patients may have more prominent tremor. And so the goal of many of our therapies, whether it's medicines, surgery, is to try to shift more of the time during the day to the on state and away from the off state. So early in Parkinson's disease, um, when a patient maybe hasn't lost uh, too much of their uh, dopamine cells yet, um, if you take a dose of oral dopamine, levodopa, you'll see a gradual rise in dopamine levels and therefore the clinical effect that that dopamine has. And so, for a few hours, you'll have a sustained improvement in function that slowly decays back to uh, uh, native levels. But we know that what happens is as Parkinson's progresses and more dopamine cells are lost, patients become more brittle. And so uh, the time they spend in this good zone, in other words, between these blue lines where their movement is natural, feels, feels pretty good, there may not be much tremor, it starts to shrink and shrink with a single dose of medication. And late in the disease, patients may have the following phenomenon where dopamine levels are pretty low. They'll take an oral dose of dopamine. They'll actually get into a good place, maybe even pretty quickly, but then they rapidly overshoot and patients can develop uh, symptoms that are called dyskinesias, which reflect an excess of dopamine. Dyskinesias can be these kind of dancing or writhing movements that are involuntary. It's not, it's not the same as tremor, um, sometimes it may look like a patient is kind of fidgety or they can't sit still. Um, if you've seen Michael J. Fox, for example, recently, he, he sometimes has pretty severe dyskinesias. Um, but that period of dyskinesias may end quickly and then a patient may crater and go back down to a state down here where they're very slow and rigid and, and tremulous. And so, um, you know, the response to a dose of dopamine uh, changes as your Parkinson's progresses. And again, the goal of our therapies, whether it's medicine or surgery, is to try to get you to spend as much time during your day as possible during these two, uh, between these two blue lines, which is where you feel uh, good and natural. Uh, and so we refer to this brittle uh, nature or this uh, kind of fragility as, as a motor complication, and we call it wearing off. So um, complications of Parkinson's disease that can happen when you're on medical therapy can be things like the medications, they wear off quickly, you overshoot and you get dyskinesias, or you have some symptoms that don't really respond to medicines anymore, and common ones are tremor and then dystonia, which is 
uh, a painful spasming or curling of muscles. Uh, patients will often describe it in the lower legs or the feet. Uh, and so all of these things can occur as Parkinson's progresses. And on average, they affect about half of patients. Um, and on average, somewhere, somewhere in the range of five years after starting medicines. Um, and it's those patients, i.e. those that have developed motor complications that historically, traditionally, we've thought about the option of surgery. So uh, a little bit about surgery. Um, uh, I'll put this up front just to make it super clear, but uh, surgery should really be at least considered. Um, there should be a discussion about it for any patient who has developed one of the motor complications that we reviewed before. So um, medications wearing off rapidly, uh, developing dyskinesias or having symptoms that are just not really responding to medicines anymore. Um, I would also put on this list, it's not classically a motor complication, but patients who have difficulty tolerating medicines for one reason or another. So some patients will get a lot of nausea or headache with Cinemet. And so um, surgery is also an option for patients that just don't have great responses to the medicines. Um, now, this is the surgery we used to have. Um, this is something called a pallidotomy. Uh, where a probe is introduced into the brain. You can actually see the path that the probe took. And then the tip of the probe is heated up to damage a spot in the brain called the globus pallidus. Um, this, uh, until recently, had been mostly a historical uh, procedure, but there have been some developments lately uh, that I'll touch on at the end that, that mean that there's probably going to be a resurgence of this procedure in the future. Um, but pallidotomy was 20, 25 years ago replaced by uh, currently what is the state of the art for surgery for Parkinson's disease, which is, which is deep brain stimulation or DBS. Um, so this was studied almost 50 years ago and developed into a clinical therapy uh, that was approved in uh, the late 1990s for a related disorder called the central tremor and then in 2002 for Parkinson's disease. But the therapy involves delivering targeted pulses of electricity to part of the brain. Um, you can think of this kind of like a pacemaker, uh, but instead of for the heart, for the brain, um, this therapy has uh, a lot of appeal because it's reversible, it's flexible, the, the settings can be changed as a patient's uh, symptoms change over the course of the disease. Um, and at this point, there have been hundreds and thousands of patients implanted in the United States I implant these uh, pretty regularly, um, uh, often a couple per week. Um, this is what the system looks like. So um, it consists of a few different parts. There's a thin wire that's just about a millimeter, a little more than a millimeter thick that goes through the skull and into the brain. The wire then uh, runs under the skin. This whole system is under the skin inside the body. Um, behind the ear and then down uh, in the soft tissue of the neck down to a little pacemaker that we put underneath the collarbone. These are some images from patients I've implanted. Um, on the right is just an x-ray kind of showing what these look like. Um, and on the left is a little 3D schematic that, that shows a CT scan of a patient with a DBS electrode. This is actually an outdated photograph. I should make a photo of the newer systems, but just gives you a flavor for the size of, of the devices. Um, you can see a quarter for comparison. These implants are, are getting smaller by the ear um, and uh, are, are quite advanced at this point with the therapy, therapy now being over 20 years old. Um, so how does this work? Um, and importantly, does it work? You know, what, what can a patient who gets this device expect? Um, the good news is that um, we have more evidence for the effectiveness of DBS than we have for almost anything else in, in neurosurgery in my field. Um, and a lot of this is from randomized controlled trials where patients are implanted, uh, but only some of them are turned on and the patients are blinded to who's turned on. Um, so we have we've determined there's a number of benefits that patients experience. So one of them is that patients have improvements in their functional status or their ability to execute what we call activities of daily living or ADLs. So before surgery, there's quite a difference uh, for patients 
in terms of their function on medicine and off medicine. That difference shrinks or almost disappears after surgery. In other words, DBS allows you to be uh, at your best for, for more time. Uh, and that persists for years and years after the implant is put in. This, this study followed patients for five years. Um, we also know from randomized controlled trials that uh, DBS provides patients more of their best movement function time during the day. And if you look at the big studies, on average, uh, patients experience about five extra hours per day of their best function. So when you think about uh, the course of your day and how many hours you're awake and how many hours you're in a good spot versus a bad spot, uh, five extra hours to most, most patients is, is quite meaningful. Um, most importantly, a uh, variety of studies have demonstrated that patients uh, across a wide variety of metrics report a better quality of life after DBS versus before. Uh, and, and frankly, that's uh, the most important thing. Um, but, you know, as they say, the proof is in the pudding. You know, there's nothing like uh, seeing a, a patient with the device off and then turned on. Um, I think these are actually patients with tremor. I didn't you know, the other day I have a video on my phone of somebody with Parkinson's, but um, just gives you an idea about how quickly the response is when uh, the device is off versus on. So we'll start with this patient's tremor when the DBS is turned off. He's holding a little Purell there. It's, it's obviously shaking quite a bit. And then a moment later, we turn on the device and, uh, you know, pretty still. I think we have another patient here this patient has had DBS on one side, treating the tremor on one side. He hasn't yet had the DBS on the other side. He has since gone and had that second side treated, but it's pretty easy to guess which of the two sides he's had treated. So these differences are quite striking visually. Um, you can go on YouTube and find, you know, hundreds or thousands of videos like this. These are my own patients, but, um, you know, it, it, it's why I think this is one of the most gratifying procedures that I do. Patients are, are generally tremendously impacted and grateful, and the effects are, they're not subtle and they happen quite quickly. Um, so a summary of benefits uh, of DBS. So as we talked about, it improves functional status, independence, what we call activities of daily living. Patients have more of their best movement time, again, what we call on time during the day. Um, it reduces the movement symptoms of Parkinson's disease, so tremor, stiffness and slowness, and uh, dystonia. Um, most patients are able to substantially reduce their doses of medicines, uh, i.e. lower doses and maybe fewer doses during the day. And then again, most importantly, patients uh, across the board, study after study, and anecdotally in my experience, describe a much better quality of life. Um, so what do I talk about with a patient when I see them in the office um, in terms of setting expectations for this? So there's some things that are important to understand that, that you might not realize if you just hear a talk like this or, or read something online. Um, so DBS is very effective for movement symptoms of Parkinson's disease or what we call motor symptoms, especially those that respond to levodopa or cinnamet. Um, DBS is typically not effective for non-movement symptoms, so constipation, sense of smell, um, cog uh, cognition, thinking, and memory. Some of these things that we don't think about as movement-related, DBS typically does not help. Um, I would say the exception to this rule is tremor. So even if tremor or, or dystonia is not responding to medicines anymore, we can generally get it, res get it to respond to DBS, okay? Um, DBS is not a cure. We don't have a cure uh, in 2023 for Parkinson's disease. There's a lot of exciting work that's in early stages related to gene therapy. In other words, trying to replace uh, genes or cells that produce uh, dopamine. We do not have those uh, close to clinical use yet. Um, but patients with DBS uh, do experience significant symptom relief, and most of them describe that it feels like their uh, symptom clock is set back by about five years. Um, so this device, uh, you know, will continue to work as your Parkinson's progresses. The settings will change. Your, your need for the therapy and the amount of therapy will change, but it will continue to help you. Um, and again, DBS provides more of your best movement function time during the day, but it typically doesn't change the quality of that time much. So 
Um, you may spend more hours at your best, but your, your best level may not be a ton different than it is on medicines. Um, who's a candidate for DBS? We've kind of gone over this a little bit, um, but we look for patients who've had Parkinson's disease for at least a few years with, with some exceptions. Um, and I'll talk about why that is. Um, we look for patients that have a good response to levodopa or cinnamet. Um, the exception to this is patients who can't tolerate uh, levodopa or cinnamet for some reason due to side effects. And again, we're looking for patients who've developed motor complications, and we've gone over what those are. Um, now, this represents a substantial number of patients with Parkinson's disease. Many patients will fall into this bucket, um, but somewhere in the order of only 15 to 20 percent of Parkinson's patients ever get surgery. And, you know, I think the greatest barrier is that most patients simply don't have familiarity. They never learn about the therapy. Their doctor doesn't recommend that they meet a surgeon or go through the evaluation process. And I think that's a shame, um, having seen the therapy and, and what it can do for people. And it's what we're trying to fix or correct with, with webinars like this one. Um, so when should a patient think about DBS? We've kind of talked about the symptoms. Um, you know, there's a thought out there that, oh gosh, I want to wait as long as possible. Um, there's some reasons that that's not always a great idea. So we have uh, randomized controlled trials that suggest that treating patients a little earlier on is probably better. And it just means that they have more years to benefit from the therapy and enjoy the therapy. This was a, a trial in the New England Journal. I won't, I won't go through all the details. Um, but, you know, we're trying to shift what, when we're focusing on patients from late in the disease to earlier in the disease course where you know they're not yet totally disabled or dependent and they stand to benefit again from the therapy for longer. Um, so you might carry that to the logical conclusion and say, well, why not implant this right when I get diagnosed? What's the reason for that? Um, two things I would say about that. So the first is that we just have a rule of thumb, a general rule in medicine that we try to start with less invasive therapy before going to more invasive therapy. Surgery is relatively invasive. And so we like to see first uh, that patients maybe can benefit from medicines. And um, some patients do really well with medicines and don't end up needing surgery long term. Um, that's certainly not the case for everybody. But in general, we don't, we don't start uh, therapy for different disorders with brain surgery most of the time. Um, the second thing is that there are some patients who initially will look like they have Parkinson's disease, but in fact will have a uh, form of atypical Parkinson's, uh, atypical Parkinson's, or sometimes what we call Parkinson's plus disorders. These can mimic um, Parkinson's disease in the beginning, but they have a different uh, natural history and they end up in different places. And we have evidence that these are not helped as much by DBS. And so we, we also want to screen out the small number of patients that actually have a different disorder. Uh, examples of these are multi-system multi atrophy, Lewy body disease, uh, PSP or progressive supranuclear palsy, and then cortical basal degeneration. Um, these are tough disorders that are just treated differently than Parkinson's disease. A little bit about the nuts and bolts of, of surgery. So, um, we have two targets in the brain that we can use for DBS. One is called the subthalamic nucleus or STN. It's the orange structure that you see highlighted here and this little dot is our usual target. Um, the other is the globus pallidus internus or GPI uh, in dark blue or, or um, and, and this is the purple target that we typically aim for. Uh, we don't have to dwell on uh, the details of these, but suffice to say, we've had a big clinical trial in the United States that suggests that these two targets are, are more or less equivalent in terms of the benefits that they provide patients. Uh, neurologists usually have a preference uh, of one or the other, uh, and there's some subtle differences between them that lead me to favor one or another for an individual patient. I would say nowadays more patients are getting um, subthalamic nucleus or STN stimulation than GPI, but both are valid and, and have decades of experience. Um, so what does the process of having surgery look like from a patient's eyes? What are the steps involved is a common question that I get. Um, first one, as we've talked about, is simply just a, a diagnosis of Parkinson's disease, usually by a, a neurologist. 
um, and then starting medical therapy. And typically patients will be on medicines for several years before they develop the motor complications that we talked about. Again, wearing off, uh, dyskinesias, and then motor symptoms that are not responsive any longer to, uh, to medicines. Um, Ideally, the development of one or more of these symptoms would trigger an evaluation at a big surgical center that, that treats patients with Parkinson's like mine. Um, and that evaluation consists of a few things, not necessarily in this order, but um, meeting with a surgeon, a person like myself, um, what's called an on-off test or a levodopa sensitivity uh, challenge. This is where you visit with your neurologist or sometimes a physical therapist uh, twice, um, or sometimes it can be done in the same day, but first when you're not on your medicine. So often this is first, uh, first thing in the morning, and then later, maybe an hour, hour and a half after you've taken your medicines. And the idea is that we're scoring your movement function just to see that there's a difference between those two states. Because as I mentioned, the best prediction of who responds well to DBS is who responds well to medicine. Um, there's also a meeting with uh, a neuropsychologist and then some scans of the brain that we use to plan the surgery. Very common question I get from patients, why do I need to meet with a psychologist? What's this all about? Um, so Parkinson's disease, as some of you might know, over time does cause problems with thinking and memory. Um, and in certain cases, if those changes are already present and already severe, uh, DBS can actually make them worse. And so Screening patients really allows us to do a few things. So it helps us choose the right patients for surgery. Um, it helps us choose the right surgery for a patient. And then it helps us minimize the risks of cognitive problems in those patients who do have surgery. Um, so um, for me, it's, it's a safety check. I have every patient get uh, a neuropsychological evaluation. And importantly, most insurance companies insist on it or require it. Um, and so it's just a part of the process. It can, it can really yield valuable information and I really appreciate the input of my neuropsychologists that I work with. It just helps me do a better job uh, in terms of making the surgery safer for you. Um, and then uh, comes the surgery. And I think we have some uh, pictures here coming up, but surgery often consists of two steps. So the first one is the bigger one. That's where we put uh, the wires in the brain. And that involves a one night hospital stay. And the second surgery is smaller. It's usually an outpatient or day surgery where you go home afterwards. And that's where we put the battery or the uh, pulse generator in the chest. There's no uh, hospital stay associated with that. So a little bit about uh, what the surgery looks like. So before you ever show up for surgery, I've done some work um, a few days or a week before doing the planning. I uh, use the brain scans that we get um, and import it into our software to create a 3D model of your brain that allows me to pick the target that I want to implant the electrode at. Um, this is the day of surgery. Uh, you can see me. I'm setting up the sterile surgical field. Here's the patient's head. Um, this is a big CAT scanner that's put around the patient so we can check the location of the wire when we put it in. Um, and I'm here draping the surgical robot that I use to, to help me put these in. Um, common misconception, oh my gosh, a robot is doing my surgery. Uh, if only it were that easy. So um, robots are really good at precision tasks. Um, so this, this big expensive 800 pound uh, robot is basically just a precision aiming device. In other words, I pick a target in your brain, I show the robot where your head is and I show it on the scan what I wanna hit. And the robots are really good at aiming at things with millimeter precision. It turns out the robot never actually touches you during the surgery. It just, just kind of guides me to my target. Uh, and it's quite good at it. So um, if the green crosshair is the target I selected for this surgery and the white dot is the electrode, you can see that it, it's placed exactly where I want it. So this is a CAT scan I've checked during surgery. Um, I do uh, a couple minutes of recordings to look for uh, some of the brain rhythms we know are associated with Parkinson's disease. In this case, it's called a beta rhythm. Um, it's a nice confirmation that we're in the right spot. And then we spend a few minutes um, testing uh, a patient's arms uh, or legs or face just to see that when we turn on the stimulator temporarily that we're seeing the effects that we want and we're not seeing any side effects. 
Um, I think this is a pretty important step. Not every surgeon does this step. It's a matter of personal preference. But uh, for me, I never want a patient to show up to their neurologist's office and have the device turned on and there to be a surprise, you know, there to be side effects that we don't anticipate or not as much benefit as we're hoping. And so in the operating room, we're able to fix any, any issue um, with the placement of the wire. And so I like, I like to be right the first time and not to have to come back. Um, so this is a, a wonderful nurse, uh, Gaitha, that I work with doing a little bit of testing of the patient's arm. We'll look for tremor, we'll look for rigidity and other uh, signs and symptoms of Parkinson's disease to see that they're getting better as we turn it on. So we spend just a few minutes doing that, um, and then I'll close up the incision, and the patient, um, like I said, will spend one night in the hospital and typically go, typically go home early the next morning. Um, the second surgery is the battery surgery. Um, that's a much smaller procedure, um, takes about 20, 25 minutes. Patients are not awake for this. We don't have to do any testing, and I'll make a little nick here, um, and I'll send the wire down, um, beneath the collarbone and then make a little incision here to put the pacemaker in. Um, common question I get, a discussion I have with every patient that I see is what are the risks of this procedure? We, we've talked a lot about the benefits, but what about the risks? Um, common ones that I think should be mentioned, so infection, um, fortunately this is uh, quite rare, uh, less than 1%. Um, I implant, you know, um, quite a few of these, and I've had only one infection in the, the last four years, so my infection rate is uh, well less than 1%. If you look in the literature, it's something like 6 or 7%, so uh, I think we're doing pretty well. Um, a risk that the therapy doesn't meet expectations, so um, we haven't had a good conversation about what to expect in terms of benefits, um, and you could be disappointed. Um, and so I'd say that I, I spend a lot of time with patients on this in the office talking about what are your symptoms, which ones are likely to get better, which ones are not. And again, we do that levodopa uh, challenge to kind of see how you respond to medicine just to be able to help predict that. Um, as I mentioned, uh, a risk of cognitive changes or worsening. I think in practice, the risk that that is noticeable to you is quite low, uh, and that's because we do a careful job of screening patients beforehand to try to avoid that. Uh, and then finally, the, the scary one that most people are worried about, which is bleeding in the brain. Um, this is well less than 1% that it, uh, that it would cause symptoms for you, and so um, I, I think it's been about four years since I've had one of those, and, and uh, that patient recovered entirely, but it's just the nature of putting any wire in the brain, there's a risk that the wire causes bleeding. Um, it's just fortunately quite low. Um, another question I've had from one of these webinars is I'm meeting with a surgeon. I wanna know kind of what to ask, what to think about. Um, here are some things I would suggest. You know, this is a, a list that's just my thought. Uh, of course, this is personal and you may have other things you're curious about, but. Again, I think uh, to the first point, uh, setting expectations is really important. So which of my symptoms is likely to get better, which is not? Um, should we treat one or both sides of the brain? So one side of the brain controls the opposite side of the body. You may have symptoms on only one side. You may have symptoms on more than one side. And um, there's reasons to do one or both. And um, uh, that's just important to discuss with your doctor to understand what's, what's the right decision for you. Um, should I get a rechargeable battery, a non-rechargeable battery? Both versions exist. Might surprise you um, which one you'd prefer. So just something to talk about. Um, how does the surgeon perform the surgery? I've talked a little bit about what I do. Um, what should you expect in the operating room? Should you take your medicines on the day of or avoid some of them? And then what to expect after surgery in terms of uh, aftercare and, and um, things that you might notice when you go home. Um, in terms of after we put the device in, what should you expect? Um, usually two to three visits to your neurologist um, to turn the device on and tweak the settings to optimize them for you. That will probably also involve scaling back uh, some of your medicines because you won't need as much medicine when the device is turned on. Um, and then most patients will have follow-up visits uh, a few times a year with their neurologist after they're dialed in just to check in, to check the battery, and to make minor tweaks if they're having symptoms that um, are not 
totally addressed by the system. And then, as I mentioned, um, charging at home, meaning using a device to charge up your battery can be once uh, or twice a week versus battery replacements. The batteries nowadays are, are quite good. And so I think on average, um, the estimates for the batteries I'm putting in lately are that they're gonna last somewhere on the order of seven to 12 years. So patients are not needing battery replacements very often. Um, so here's, here's kind of the new stuff, the exciting stuff, uh, a little bit about advances and what we're doing for Parkinson's. Um, some of this relates to the technology we use for DBS, and this is one example. So conventionally, when this therapy first came out in the 1990s, uh, the electrodes just delivered stimulation kind of in a sphere, 360 degrees around the little electrode contact. Uh, we now have systems that allow us to steer or aim the current. Um, and this can be valuable if the lead is, is close to two structures and we want to stimulate one of them but not the other. I think in practice, I don't have many patients that end up using this kind of um, therapy, but it's a nice feature and there's some evidence out there that it may lead to fewer uh, uh, lead revisions or need for revision surgery. We've already talked about uh, robotic implantation, which I think is fantastic. I've done this surgery in lots of different ways over the years. and. I've converged on this one for the past three years or so, and uh, it's just a fantastic way to, to do this accurately and, and efficiently and safely. Um, again, here is a photo of, of what this looks like. Um, really exciting technology. This is actually Medtronic's product um, that allows us to listen to the brain. Um, in other words, to detect the rhythms that we know are correlated with symptoms of Parkinson's disease. Um, conventionally, traditionally, the therapy has just been giving you the same stimulation all day at the same, uh, at the same power and the same rate, and that works pretty well, but we do know that patients' symptoms fluctuate during the day. And so this technology, um, when, when it's fully uh, available, this device is available, but some of the features are, um, we're waiting for clearance from the FDA to be unlocked, but um, when it's fully available, uh, this system will automatically listen to the brain and make adjustments to the therapy depending on kind of where you are in your day and what needs you have. So I think that's really exciting. We were the first um, team in Colorado to implant this. This was now uh, maybe two or three years ago when we first put this in, but uh, exciting technology. We're really just at the forefront of this, what's called adaptive or closed loop DBS. Um, and then some of the systems are allowing us to program patients, not when they're in the office, but remotely. So for patients who live really far away from their neurologist, um, you know, there's options to program the device over a video conference like so many of us do with telemedicine nowadays. Um, the leads themselves, the wires that we insert are just getting more and more sophisticated. This is more of an engineering type slide. Uh, and then, you know, we talked about two surgical targets in the brain. Um, there's actually research being done, and this is a popular target in Europe, but not yet in the United States, for different parts of the brain that, that we can target. I've done it a few times. This is a patient with um, both essential tremor and Parkinson's disease, and we were trying to treat both. Um, but uh, one of the newer targets is called the caudal zona inserta. Um, and then there's also work on some alternatives to DBS. And I know there's a lot of buzz about this, and I, I do one of these procedures, so I wanted to talk about it for a bit, uh, or I do a couple of these procedures, I guess. But um, so one option for patients uh, where all we're really trying to treat is tremor is something called a thalamotomy. And this is a procedure we've actually had for a long time. We've had it for longer than DBS. Um, it's appealing because there's no incision, there's no implant. Um, uh, in this case, it's a gamma knife thalamotomy. It's being done with radiation. Uh, it's done as an outpatient procedure. Um, and gamma knife uh, can be very effective for tremor, but it doesn't treat other symptoms of Parkinson's disease. And there can be quite a delay before the effect uh, is realized, sometimes six months or more. And so I would very seldom do this uh, for patients with Parkinson's disease, but an alternative to this that uh, is much more popular now, and I've been using a, a good amount, is something called focused ultrasound. And I suspect some of you have heard of this. Um, so thalamotomy just refers to the creation of a tiny lesion in the thalamus, which is uh, a deep structure in the brain that we think is involved. 
um, in uh, the circuit that causes tremor. And so we can make um, that lesion with, uh, sorry, uh, we can make that lesion with radiation. We can make it with a probe that we heat up, or we can actually make it with ultrasound waves that kind of converge on that spot in the brain and heat it up. Um, and so this is a, a procedure that was developed for essential tremor for another tremor disorder, um, but has actually shown promise for Parkinson's disease. And um, this is what it looks like. So um, the patient is, an MRI, is in an MRI scanner. I'm outside in the control room. I'm picking a target in the brain, uh, applying the ultrasound energy and watching that little spot in the brain heat up just for a few seconds. This is probably only over the course of 10 or 15 seconds. Um, and you can see over the course of the procedure that this patient's tremor improves uh, dramatically. They have a lot of trouble drawing a spiral at the beginning and at the end, you know, they, they have a pretty decent spiral and you can also read their handwriting. Um, again, it creates a tiny lesion in the brain that's about the size of a pea. Uh, another before and after. I think we've got some more before and after uh, pictures here. Um, this is a Parkinson's patient. Um, here's her spiral beforehand, not much of a spiral. Uh, and after the procedure, uh, her <laughs> handwriting wasn't legible. Uh, her name was legible after that, so I, I covered it up, but just uh, gives you an idea. Um, this is the side that we treated. This is her untreated side. So. Um, you know, pretty effective. Uh, and importantly, this seems to be a durable effect that lasts for years. Um, there can be side effects from focused ultrasound thalamotomy. In fact, they're quite common. The most common one that I see in patients is a little bit of unsteadiness with gait for a few weeks after the procedure. This generally gets better, um, but you have to be really careful in the first few weeks after we do this that you don't fall down. There are some other things that can happen. I found that these are not quite as common, but patients may experience them a little bit. And for the most part, they tend to resolve over time. Um, so, you know, this is, this is a, a great tool, um, but I think it's really important to understand that for Parkinson's disease, this is usually not gonna be the preferred treatment. Um, you know, this is effective, but it really only treats tremor. It does not treat uh, the other movement symptoms of Parkinson's that we talked about, rigidity, uh, stiffness, slowness, uh, trouble with gait. In fact, if anything, it probably makes gait worse. Um, we can only treat one side of the brain at the time. So in other words, one side of the body. And as I mentioned, side effects are uh, very common. In fact, much more common than with DBS, uh, but fortunately they generally get better over time. Uh, not all insurance companies are on board with this yet. Uh, that'll change over time, but, but some companies don't cover it now. And uh, again, you know, we're mostly doing this for patients with essential tremor, occasionally for patients with Parkinson's disease that are just not great candidates for DBS for one reason or another. Most patients will have more benefit with DBS, but we still consider this from time to time. Um, so, I mentioned pallidotomy earlier in the talk. Um, there has been a renewed interest in this procedure because now of our ability to do it with the focused ultrasound without having to make an incision or put a patient under anesthesia. So, this procedure is very similar to the thalamotomy with the ultrasound that I just mentioned, except we're targeting the globus pallidus, a different structure in the brain. And the promise of this is that it will treat hopefully more than just tremor, and, and early studies suggest that's the case. Just like a thalamotomy with the ultrasound, this is outpatient, there's no incision. It's almost certainly going to be a procedure that we do on one side of the brain at a time. Um, but this is relatively new, and we don't understand uh, all of the long-term implications yet or the outcomes. It will probably not uh, work out to be more effective than DBS. It will probably be less effective, but studies are still pending on that. Um, it was actually approved by the FDA uh, recently on the basis of a clinical trial that was, uh, that was published. Um, but what's the catch? Uh, the catch is that uh, this is not currently covered, uh, to my knowledge, by any insurance company, including Medicare. So this may change in the coming years. Um, and I suspect. You know, there are some patients out there who are not going to be great DBS candidates where this is going to be a good option. 
uh, but we are not really using this uh, clinically yet. I, I'm hopeful that that will change in the next few years. Um, with that, I'm going to wrap up. Uh, I'm not sure how we're doing on time. Looks like we have a little time for questions, but um, I'm going to make a quick plug for my website, which I've put on the bottom of several of these slides. Um, it has a lot of information covering the stuff that we've talked about. So there are pages on DBS, there are pages on Parkinson's disease, um, there's pages on focused ultrasound, and then you can download PDFs of um, guides I provide for patients regarding DBS, regarding Parkinson's disease. Um, I often will give these as handouts to patients in the office when they come to see me. I just think it's helpful um, to try to remember some of what we talked about um, once you leave the office and, and to form the basis for other questions you might have about the procedures and about the diagnosis. Uh, so with that, I'll wrap up and thank you guys for listening. And I'm happy at this time to take any questions if we have any in the queue. We do. So, excuse me if I don't say this correctly, but does DBS help with myofascial tightness? Um, so, I would have to know a little bit more um, about this particular uh, patient's disorder, and maybe this is not the right forum for that. Um, I would say, you know, if that is related to dystonia, I think that is possible that it would benefit. I would say another uh, another good rule of thumb is if this is a symptom that you see gets better with a dose of Cinemet or with doses of medicine during the day, it is something that may well respond to DBS. But I think that would probably be a little less predictable um, and hard for me to answer without knowing some more details about it. Great. Is DBS reversible? Um, DBS is reversible, and by reversible, um, it could mean a couple things. One could be you know, you can turn it off. Uh, number two could be you could take it out. Um, you know, in the four years I've been in Colorado, I have not taken out, and I planted hundreds of patients with DBS. I have never taken one out because a patient didn't like it or, um, you know, didn't want it. So I, I think, if anything, that is a real validation of how much it helps people. Um, but yes, in, in the event that there's a problem where it needs to be taken out, it, it can be taken out. If PD has progressed, <clears throat> excuse me, and a person has dyskinesia, is the dyskinesia reduced slash corrected by DBS? So um, dyskinesia, I think, as I mentioned, um, is related basically to over-treatment, usually with medicines, okay? So when your dopamine levels are really high, patients tend to get dyskinetic. There's some exceptions to that, but in, as a general rule of thumb, that's how we often think about it. Um, and so by providing DBS, we can generally smooth out, instead of the day looking like this, we can smooth it out more um, and as a result, avoid some of the dyskinesias, uh, in part because we can reduce medicines. DBS can also cause dyskinesias because it's a form of therapy that's treating the circuit that's involved uh, in, in the symptoms of Parkinson's. Um, but we have the ability to fine tune it. And remember, DBS is running all the time in the background. It's not a pill that you take and getting metabolized and getting to a high level in your system and then dropping. And so often we are able to substantially reduce uh, dyskinesias with DBS. Remember, it's one of the reasons that we consider patients for surgery. Wonderful. Can a person who has had DBS implanted later possibly benefit from gene therapy that may be offered at a later time? Yeah, I mean, um, you know, it's it's something we can't answer right now. I think um, my suspicion um, is that, uh, you know, DBS is what we have now. If we have gene therapy in five years, I don't, I don't see that having had a DBS would prevent somebody from having gene therapy. Um, but it's simply an open question because that therapy is not in clinical use yet. And um, we just really don't know what to expect. So that's that's a difficult one to answer. Is focus ultrasound reversible? No. Focus ultrasound is a lesion in the brain. You know, you've damaged uh, a part of the brain. Again, it's really small. It's smaller than the size of a pea. Um, but uh, once you've injured that spot, there's no regenerating it. Um, 
as the swelling goes down from the injury, a lot of the side effects that I mentioned earlier will fade and, and go away. Um, but there's no undoing, you know, if you cut a nerve, for example, um, you, you can't regrow it or, or you can sew it back together, but it's never going to work the same way. And the same is true of the brain. So it's not reversible. Got it. So, Phil, I see that your hand is raised, so you can go ahead and unmute yourself. So you can answer. So you can ask your question. Yes, I, I just had a quick question on medications that you would recommend uh, to address the tremor. I, I take a standard carbidova levodova, uh, and I'm taking a propanol. Propanol. Propranolol. Yes, for for the tremor, and it, it you know, I'm, I started out on 10 milligrams three times a day, then I went to uh, 20 three times a day for, um, and it you know it it seems to help a little bit, but I didn't know if there was some other medication that you might recommend for the tremor. Yeah, um, I'll say a couple things. One is you know this is a webinar. I can't I can't give personal medical advice, but number two, so. As a surgeon, I don't I don't um, prescribe the medicine so much. That's what I kind of leave in the realm of the neurologist. But um, a couple comments I would make. So one is that you know while Cinemed is um, kind of the standard medicine for Parkinson's, propranolol is not. Propranolol is typically used for essential tremor. Obviously, I don't know all the details of of, uh, of your symptoms, right. um, but there's a ton of other medicines and. Um, you know, a suggestion I have for patients that end up on sometimes unusual uh, medicine regimens is um, if you don't have a movement disorder neurologist, um, I, I think most patients with Parkinson's disease are best served if their care ultimately is with a movement specialist. And so, um, you know, if you were to connect with me or reach out, I'm happy to suggest some that I know that I think do a fantastic job. Um, but they are kind of the wizards of um, putting together medication regimens that really optimize um, care for patients with Parkinson's. And all they do is see patients with movement disorders like Parkinson's. Sometimes with a general neurologist, their knowledge of some of the newer drugs for Parkinson's is a little more limited. And so um, this might be something where a movement specialist could be really of, of help or benefit. Okay, thank you. Wonderful. Um, Susan, you also have your hand raised, so you can go ahead and ask your question. Hi, yeah, thank you for the webinar. Um, I, my question was your comment around the um, data with patients seeing for getting DBS, having the DBS procedure done, an average of maybe five years of, you know, kind of dialing back on their symptoms. Was that by any chance based on like actual clinical trial data or is that kind of just more anecdotal? Do we know if there's any data supporting that? So, you know, it's it's a kind of a colloquial way of putting this. Um, I, I couldn't off the top of my head tell you if, if this is a particular trial. From different neurologists I've worked with and from my experience, this is something we just tell patients as a rule of thumb is that, um, you know, your disease progression is not set back by five years. Your disease will still progress. Um, and we don't really think that DBS changes the rate at which the dopamine cells will die, um, for example. Right. But typically, patients will describe that their patients, excuse me, their symptoms are kind of what they were several years before. And so that's a rule of thumb we use in the clinic based on what patients tell us. Obviously, that's not true for everybody. Um, and if you get surgery when you haven't had Parkinson's symptoms for five years, I mean, this, of course, doesn't apply. Um, but, but that's kind of a rule of thumb that a lot of us in the field use to kind of convey what to expect at basic level to patients. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. All righty. We also have Bill. So, Bill, go ahead and ask your question. Uh, thank you. Uh, doctor, I've talk to other people who believe have had a DBS treatment, and one or several of them have described uh, where the neurosurgeon has to go in and actually move the probe in order to get some improvement in the result or change a negative. And I don't, you didn't touch on that, and I don't know if these guys are 
Whistling Dixie or if there's something there to be concerned about? Oh, it's a real problem. Um, and this is why it's really important to get surgery at a big center. So um, I did talk about it a bit um, in terms of the directional stimulation has been shown to reduce that risk a little bit. Um, you know, to put this very simply, if you don't test a patient during surgery, say you do it with them asleep, um, you may find out when you turn it on and they're in the office that you're not getting the effects that you want. Um, I think in the four years and hundreds I've put in here, I've not had to move somebody's wire. Okay. So, um, and that's not just because I'm sending the patient somewhere else, which is what happens sometimes. But um, I think if you're diligent and you check a CAT scan, you check a recording, you check the patient's response to the stimulation, you have a really good idea of what a patient can expect. If you skip some of those steps, if it's somebody who doesn't do a lot of these surgeries, Yes, you may need a revision. And I commonly see patients that are coming from other places who need revisions um, because one of these steps was not performed and the lead is not, you know, I just operated on somebody earlier this week who needs a lead revision from another surgeon because they're not seeing the benefits that they were hoping for. And, um, you know, it, it is a problem in the field and, you know, um, it's why doing your homework and talking with a surgeon about how they do it, what their revision rates are, is important. Um, but yes, that can happen, absolutely. Thank you. All righty, I think we have time to answer one more question, if anyone has another question to ask. All righty, we got one. How long does the process usually take from evaluation to surgery? Also, is overnight challenge without levodopa done at home? Parentheses um, followed by seeing response to, okay. Yeah, that's the question. Okay, so on the first, um, I think for most patients, it's typically a few months from um, the start of the evaluation to when the surgery is done and it gets programmed. And that's for a few things. You have to meet the surgeon. You have to think about this. You have to do the testing. Um, you have to schedule the surgery and then, you know, the care after the surgery. So for most people, that works out to be a few months. It's not 12 months. It may be three or four months. Just depends. Depends a little bit on where you're doing this and what their protocols are. Um, and then uh, about can you do the testing at home? You know, I'm not aware of anyone who goes to patients' home and does uh, homes and does this testing. So, you know, for some of you who are really affected, it might mean that you have to get somebody to drive you in the morning to your uh, PT's office or neurologist's office to do the testing. Um, but many of them can do the testing just in one setting, uh, one sitting. You know, you, you come in first thing in the morning, not having to